This is a hearing of the City Council's Committee on Environment and Sustainability, and we're here to discuss a docket that I offer, docket number 0162, in order to consider the benefits of net zero carbon requirements and incentives for future construction in the City of Boston. I want to thank the advocates on this issue, particularly the Boston Clean Energy Coalition, who helped call attention to the issue of harmful environmental impacts of residential and commercial buildings. Today is the first time we have introduced the idea of net zero carbon to the Boston City Council, but it is certainly will not be the last. Boston can reach net zero carbon by committing to construction buildings in which all carbon emissions are offset by renewable energy production. Mayor Walsh uh, has very admirably agreed to carbon neutrality by 2050, and Boston's goal has been set. This is part of the green print of getting there. We often talk about blueprints. I want to have green print in our lexicon of what we're going to do. Uh, on June 15th, I was with many people in this chamber as we facilitated the Jamaica Plain Forum's uh, evening titled, How Do We Get to Net Zero? It was an incredibly illuminating conversation, and it really helped uh, prepare me to see what the possibility could be. Uh, subsequently, on Wednesday, August 2nd, I filed this hearing order to discuss Boston's role in achieving net zero carbon. Uh, a couple of items before we get into our panels. I uh, wanted to, of course, acknowledge, and I'll introduce her for some uh, opening remarks, the Council President, my dear colleague and friend on this and so many great environmental issues, City Councilor at Large, Michelle Wu. Uh, I also wanted to acknowledge a councillor-elect, uh, the District 7 City Councillor-elect, Kim Janey, who is with us. She's sitting there for now. In about three more weeks, she'll be down here. We don't do applause typically, but for our councillor-elect, who's really been a leader on this and so many issues, we are delighted to have you, councillor. Thank you. and looking forward to working with you on this. Um, very, very briefly, buildings contribute to over half of Boston's greenhouse gas emissions uh, in our city. And as Boston is quickly becoming susceptible to the impact of climate change with rising sea levels and extreme le le weather, we must lead in coming up with innovative and sustainable solutions. Now more than ever, there is an utter paucity of leadership in Washington, D.C., and it's up to cities and towns to fight and combat climate change. We've seen some cities uh, leading in this space uh, across the river in Cambridge, Massachusetts, as well as Austin, Texas, Fort Collins, Colorado, and Palo Alto, California, have already implemented successful net zero strategic plans. Now, as we move forward in the construction of new buildings, we should not only consider its affordability, but also the carbon footprint of these buildings. For every environmental issue that we work on, I always reiterate that these solutions are not only good for the environment, but almost always good for the taxpayer and the ratepayer as well. I don't want to belabor the point, but working with Council President Wu and passing Community Choice Energy has proven that out. Uh, most recently, we passed a plastic bag ordinance, which is, will also bear that out as well. Uh, we've seen, we have a lot to get through, so let's do jazz hands uh, for applause, please. Uh, we've seen it here in Boston with the Castle Square Apartments in the South End uh, is really a model for the future of energy efficient residential buildings. In 2011, the energy retrofits undergone by over 190 of the units at Castle Square Complex ended up reducing energy usage by 72%, and the complex now saves $213,000 annually. That's nearly a quarter of a million dollars annually in energy savings after the energy efficient upgrade. We're going to hear from some experts a little bit later after the mayoral panel, as well as we invite everyone here to testify who can talk to that point as well. Uh, as it relates to buildings, we have an opportunity here, and I know we're, our first panel is from the mayoral administration, two dear friends to many of us, Commissioner Carl Spector, Commissioner of the Environment Department, and John Dalzell, the Senior Architect of Sustainable Development at the, BPTA, at the BPDA. Uh, these two gentlemen, who I know are committed to this cause as well, are going to talk about some of the great work and the strategy that's happening right now. We applaud that, and we are grateful for that. I would simply say that we unfortunately do not have the luxury of time to wait on many of these issues. In implementing plans that make sense and that will be beneficial, we need to be focused on, and that's what's going to spur this. Um, the last council meeting of the year will be this Wednesday, which means there'll be no action on this other than a hearing order. But I know the new council, God willing, I will be able to help uh, facilitate this as well. In January of next year, we'll be able to con continue this conversation and really help uh, get to a solution where we can have a impact sooner rather than later. So really looking forward to everything. Some brief housekeeping items. This is being taped uh, and streamed as well as on local cable. Uh, there are sign-in sheets. I have at least three sheets already. There's more to the left. We will stay here as long as it takes so that everyone can testify. 
um, and uh, the panels will be the mayoral administration first, followed by the experts, and then advocates before we get to uh, public testimony. So having said that, before we get to you gentlemen, uh, Council President Wu, any thoughts? Or Cass, <laughs> any thoughts? Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your leadership on this and so many other issues that we're, we're really thrilled that Boston is now taking action on uh, in partnership oh. with folks in this room and uh, all the organizations that you represent. I, I wanted to apologize because I'm going to be popping in and out. I had one thing quickly scheduled at 2.30, so I'll be back right after that. Um, so I wanted to say on the record before that that I completely agree with whatever actions we can take urgently on this, that it's important to talk about resiliency and adaptation, but we cannot depend on just waiting for every new disaster or the impacts of climate change to come and figure out how we're going to pay for dealing with them. We have to actively take actions to reduce, mitigate, and prevent the worst of what could happen today. Um, and sec the second point I wanted to make is that it's all well and good to work with our commercial partners and big businesses and ask them voluntarily to adopt certain standards. And I know many are great partners in the city, but be we are in the situation we are in now as a planet because our current economic system locks in these incentives for people not to uh, take the most sustainable actions. So we have to actively change the economic system and I believe it's only through putting some teeth behind regulations that we start to shape um, the parameters by which development happens and by which business occurs in the city. And, and then we get to the, the double, triple bottom line, but we do need to take actions and, and um, sort of codify these rules into the law. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge we've been joined by my dear friend and colleague from District 5, City Councilor Tim McCarthy. Councilor McCarthy, any opening Thank thoughts? you, Mr. Chair. I couldn't agree with uh, Michelle. I did hear uh, Matt's opening statement. Couldn't agree with uh, both of them more. I think the uh, important piece is when you see Cass here, it's really about where he's going to be in 20 years, which is, uh, you know, it's scary. Uh, my guys are 20 and 18, so they're a little bit ahead of the curve, but Cass and Blaze are just three and just a little baby. So. Uh, you know, the next 20 years are very, very important, and the faster we get out of the gate, the better. And uh, that's the way I feel about it. I'm, I'm uh, happy to help Matt. I've called him the green guy before, and he's doing an unbelievable job uh, leading in this space, so I'll always be here for him. Thank you, Councilor McCarthy. Appreciate that. Uh, finally, there is a, a brief letter from Councilor, District 8 Councilor Josh Sakem saying, Chairman O'Malley, due to a prior commitment, I'm unable to attend today's hearing regarding the benefits of net zero carbon requirements and incentives. I sincerely regret that I'm unable to join you. Thank you for taking such an important topic. I share your concerns regarding the reliance of fossil fuels and the infrastructure of newly constructed buildings, and I support any efforts in this legislative body to move the city of Boston closer to carbon neutrality. Look forward to reviewing the video of the hearing and any written testimony submitted today. Uh, we've been joined by two more councillors. Uh, I believe I have the order right. The District 3 City Councillor, our friend Frank Baker. Oh, I'm sorry. We'll get to Councillor Baker in a minute. At-large Councillor, our friend City Councillor Anissa Asabi-George. Uh, welcome, Councillor Asabi-George. Hate to put you on the spot, but any opening thought? Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Baker, thank you both for being here. And then finally, I saw uh, my dear friend Henrietta Davis, the former Mayor of Cambridge and former City Councillor, has joined us as well. Thank you, Mayor uh, Davis, for joining us. Gentlemen, welcome and thank you so much. Uh, whoever wants to start, just introduce yourself, your position. And I know uh, we have a brief slide presentation as well. So okay. please. Uh, thank you, thank you, Councillor. I'm Carl Spector, Commissioner of the Environment for the City of Boston. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today to testify concerning Docket 1062 regarding zero net carbon goals for new, bo uh, new buildings in Boston. The City of Boston created its first climate action plan in 2007, which we have updated twice since then. Reducing the carbon and energy intensity of buildings has been an essential part of our greenhouse gas reduction strategy from the start. That is why we have such policies and programs in place now as our green building zoning requirements, which my colleague from the BPDA will discuss, Renew Boston, which assists property owners and residents in reducing energy use and greenhouse gas emissions, and the Building Energy Reporting and Disclosure Ordinance, which enables us to direct detailed attention to the energy and greenhouse gas performance of all large buildings in the city. Although we have been focused on our greenhouse gas reduction target of 25 percent by 2020, with the last state of our climate action plan, which Mayor Walsh released three years ago, we began to examine measures necessary to reach our long-term goal for 2050. That was 80 percent, an 80 percent reduction at the time that the plan was released, but the mayor, as you 
uh, noted Councillor O'Malley, has since raised our sights to carbon neutrality. The current plan includes such measures as piloting net zero buildings, which John will also discuss later on, evaluating performance-based standards for net zero goals, and exploring zero carbon standards for new development. Several weeks ago, Mayor Walsh announced the launch of Carbon Free Boston, a joint initiative of the city with the Green Ribbon Commission and Boston University, and I know one of the directors of the work at uh, Boston University is going to be speaking on a later panel. The initial phase of Carbon Free Boston is analyzing the benefits and costs of policies and programs, both individually and collectively, that will enable Boston to reach its carbon neutrality goal. Since buildings account for about three-fourths of Boston's greenhouse gas emissions, various approaches Many approaches to reducing building emissions will be an important part of the ongoing analysis. We expect this analysis to be completed by next summer, at which point it will become one of the bases for the next, the third update of our Climate Action Plan. We are also learning from the experience of other cities, both near and far. For example, Boston is a member of C40, an international network of cities working on climate change, and Mayor Walsh is a member of the Steering Committee. In parallel with the carbon-free Boston work, Boston is one of 25 cities around the world participating in C40's commitment to developing climate action plans compliant with the 2016 Paris Accords. Among other things, this means carbon neutrality. And we are making sure that the carbon-free Boston work is, uh, is uh, coordinated closely with the work that we're doing under C40. The city is engaged in many other greenhouse gas reduction activities, not least our commitment to lead by example in reducing energy use and greenhouse gas emissions in its own operations, which I'm also happy to describe. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today, and I would be happy to answer any questions after uh, John talks about what uh, his group is doing. Thank you, Carl. John? Thank you, Councillor O'Malley. I'm John Dalton, architect with the Boston Planning and Development Agency. The BPDA, in its capacity as the city's planning and economic development agency, works in partnership with our sister agencies, especially CARL and the uh, Office of Energy, Environment, and Open Space, to reduce Boston's greenhouse gas emissions. Our approach to sustainability is holistic and includes human health, social well-being, site, transportation, infrastructure, and neighborhood development. For today, we'll focus our comments on the zoning Article 37 Green Building Regulations, the 2017 Boston Climate Change Checklist Update, and the e Green Building Program. All three initiatives are direct, have direct bearing on Boston's carbon footprint and meeting Mayor Walsh's goal for carbon neutrality in 2050. Let me start with the zoning Article 37 Green Buildings Regulation, which was enacted in January 2017 on the recommendations of the Mayor's Green Building Task Force. These regulations made Boston the first large city in the U.S. to require private developers to build green and to evidence their sustainability practices of their projects using the U.S. Green Building Council's Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design, also known as LEED, building rating systems. The regulations are applicable to projects over 50,000 square feet and require LEED certifiable or better. Compliance is determined by the Boston Interagency Green Building Committee. Today, Boston is home to over 320 LEED buildings and projects amounting to over 77 million square feet of green buildings. Massachusetts is ranked fifth in the nation for the most green buildings, and in 2016 added the most new lead square feet of buildings nationally. Both of these are on a per capita basis. It's important to note that these totals include existing buildings, interior fit outs, and numerous other projects that are outside of our zoning regulation. This is by intent. Our goal is to transform practice across the building sector and to significantly broaden the beneficial impacts of our regulations. The market recognition elements of the LEED building rating systems enable us to do that. Today our practices are emulated by major cities around the country and from coast to coast. 
The next area of practice is our climate resiliency checklist, which was just updated uh, at our October uh, board meeting and now requires projects to assess and mitigate impacts, including those due to climate change. The resiliency checklist incorporates the findings and recommendations of the Boston Research Advisory Group and the Climate Ready Boston report that Carl has uh, mentioned. The update also reflects the mayor's carbon neutrality goal and includes specific performance targets for carbon emissions, extreme precipitation, extreme heat, and sea level rise. The resiliency checklist is a requirement of the Article 80 Large Project Review Guidelines and is applicable to all new projects over 50,000 square feet. Projects are reviewed by the Boston Interagency Green Building Committee. Projects are required to target net zero carbon emissions and to assess the design performance of the proposed project. Projects are required to include measures to eliminate, reduce, or mitigate the adverse impacts of their carbon emissions. Projects are also required to identify future adaptation strategies as needed to meet or exceed the net zero carbon performance goals. So it's really a two-phase look. What can you do now and what will you need to do and can do in the future? The last area of practice, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to advance the slides. <laughs> um, you can go ahead, maybe two. There you go, Whoop. one more, perfect. Uh, the last program that we want to mention is the E-plus Green Building Program, that's E-plus as an energy positive. It was launched by the BPDA and the Department of Neighborhood Development in 2011 with the purpose of demonstrating the feasibility for net positive energy deep green homes in Boston. The first phase offered three parcels for housing redevelopment in a design competition request for proposal format. The RFP challenged leading architects and builders and developers to work together to construct new homes that use very little energy, about the third of allowed, a third of the energy that's allowed by code, and to exceed that load with on-site solar renewable energy, that the homes be deep green, exceeding the lead for homes platinum requirements. The last of these first phase projects was just completed. In fact, there are three units for sale right now, including one affordable housing unit in the uh, Highland Park neighborhood of Roxbury. We have three years of data from the first four units. Can you advance the slides now? One, one more. And that's the first uh, completed uh, building in the Highland Park neighborhood. And one more, please. We have three years of data on the performance of these homes. And what you can see in the bottom of the chart is that they're uh, exceeding our, our goals and surplusing enough uh, renewable energy to power uh, an okay or code compliant three bedroom home. So these homes have proved out to be net positive uh, by, by a good measure. The E-plus green building program has been expanded with the offering of two larger city parcels, which should yield about 80 additional units. The design competition for the E-plus Highland Marcella Street site is now open. So there are teams starting to work on the, uh, the next phase of this initiative. Additionally, the E-plus program has been replicated by private housing developers who have proposed and built projects in Jamaica Plain and Roxbury. And by, the, and by Artists for Humanity, which has proposed an E-plus expansion to their existing building in South Boston that is under construction now. Actually might be the largest commercial energy positive building on the East Coast when it's completed. At the small residential scale, we are seeing net zero and net positive carbon buildings are feasible. And with normalization of these practices, highly feasible. In a short time, we expect to see the same at small commercial scale buildings. In time, one can imagine neighborhoods of net zero and net positive carbon buildings dramatically reducing our citywide carbon emissions. Our successes in these endeavors is dependent upon our many partners, many who are here, who supported these efforts and the extraordinary leaders and practitioners who are building the next generation of buildings now. Thank you again for your leadership and for the opportunity to share our practices here. I'm also happy to answer any questions.
Thank you both, appreciate it. And I just have uh, several questions for, first with the preface is, the reason why I was so excited to do this hearing is I think it's safe to say that virtually everyone in this room, and I know Mayor Walsh included, uh, wants the same goals here. We all, we all recognize the urgency and we all recognize the fact that, that as cities there are certain tools we can do to address this issue. Um, and I was delighted and I, I was, I'm familiar with most but not all, um, uh, John, some of the, the programs, you know, in addition to Climate Ready and Renew Boston and E-Positive and all these, th there's a number of programs. I would argue that uh, the Build PPS and certain other programs should be included in this conversation as well. There are a lot of them. Um, is there, is it one of you, is it someone else who's sort of overseeing all the different um, working groups and sort of uh, uh, processes that have been put in place to address this? Well, we've been, we've been working very closely with our colleagues in the uh, Public Facilities Department yep. and with, uh, you know, the uh, BPS on, on their building plans and, you know, both in terms of talking with them about their new buildings and, of course, how are we addressing the existing buildings. So the city has put a lot of programs in place. We've uh, instituted a, our first very large um, energy service uh, contracting. Uh, services contract, excuse me, uh, to uh, address uh, the energy efficiency of existing buildings. So, you know, the uh, the environment department works closely with the departments that have uh, direct oversight of the efficiency and energy use in our building. So there is a lot going on, uh, sure. and uh, but it's mostly coordinated through those agencies with the environment department. And, and I don't know whether John, whether you uh, participate too. Uh, serving as a facilitator and advisor of bringing resources, uh, it's, it's a collaborative effort, and also, of course, with the budget. Yep. You know, the budget no, no question on that. I guess what, what I'm asking is that today we're speaking more specifically on buildings and sort of development, which a lot of these address. Um, others talk about health, talk about some transportation, some other things. Do we have sort of a single point person that oversees that, almost like a, you know, director of everything, or is, is there a strategic plan where the heads of all these meet and are convened monthly to sort of discuss on how our goals can be in sync with one another? Um, not in the formal way, I, I think. Uh, Should there that, be? The, the, per, per, that's something for us to think yeah. about. C certainly for, for looking at the energy efficiency of existing buildings, yeah. we do have a such a committee for that through what's called, through uh, the, uh, there, there is a, a standing committee that, uh, with the Environment Department, with Budget, uh, with the Public Facilities Department, that meets regularly to coordinate work on Perfect. working at the energy of existing buildings. Obviously, uh, newer buildings come at, come along, yeah. not so often, uh, and we don't. And perhaps we should have a standing well, committee. And to again, that, that. that's that's very gratifying to hear. And I'm not looking to make more work for people. Perhaps I am. Mm -hmm. Uh, but looking at, you know, I was very proud to have played a role working with you and others in the prior administration in passing Beardo, which is something that I think was long overdue. Um, working with the folks who are discussing the existing buildings, what we can do, what incentives, and also the new development down the pipeline. Recognizing, you know, larger scale would be more likely to come under BPDA uh, oversight and so on. So as we talk about sort of a strategic plan, and, and perhaps that's what I would like the purpose of this hearing and subsequent hearings next year to really help facilitate, um, let's see if we can, and, and it should be you or you know, either of you or someone that can help make sure that all of these groups that are working towards the same goal are on the same page. Sure. Um, I think there could be enormous help in that. Um, secondly, and, and I'm not looking to sort of relitigate it, it, it is involved in this hearing, but obviously as we talk about you know, new gas infrastructure, um, I've been opposed to the West Roxbury lateral pipeline, the Back Bay pipeline. I know some folks in this room have done some yeoman's work on that, and I am very grateful for that. But my concern is we are building so much um, infrastructure for natural gas that it is going to make it very, very difficult to reach carbon neutral by 2050. So can either of you sort of speak on that? I, again, I don't want to sort of relitigate this. We're talking, this is a positive hearing, but, but that's something that's been very concerning. No, as, uh, and, and John can talk about this too, but uh, you know, as John mentioned in his remarks, the new uh, climate checklist requires buildings to consider about how, the, uh, new buildings, yeah. how they're going to contribute to reaching carbon neutrality. So that even if they're not carbon neutral today, uh, what, what, how are they thinking ahead? 
so that we're not locked in uh, the, to the way you describe. Yeah. John, you want to talk a little bit more about that? Um, there's two things, and I want to jump back to your first question, Councillor. Um, it's worth noting that the city operates with a lead by example standard for city buildings as well as projects that the city has financing or land. And so those projects are required to achieve lead silver. And in the case of city buildings, they have to be lead silver or better certified. And it's worth um, commending some of our colleagues who, who would be great to have here who have built um, lead gold and lead platinum libraries and police stations and other, other facilities around the city, um, all of which also have a, a strong emphasis on energy performance. Does lead silver, lead certified includes natural gas, correct? It does. And so let me move on to the second point, which yeah. is um, lead is holistic. So it includes things like site and location and other benefits, which also have significant carbon footprints to them. Um, a better point is to look at our E-plus green buildings, because at this level of practice, we are building all electric buildings. They do not have combustion within the buildings. They do not have gas service that sits in the street. There's no cost for gas connections. Um, we see that as the practice of the future. Um, that we will be less and less reliant on gas for things like heating and, and, and other sources, uh, combustion for cooking and so forth. Um, and, and we believe that practice is, is really feasible at this point. You don't need to uh, bring gas in, into homes to have quality homes that are, are uh, efficient and safe. You could not agree with you more, and that, that is music to my ears. I guess my concern in, in is that with the green light, and a lot of this is federal, this isn't, this isn't you guys, I want to be clear about that, but with the, the development of more and more natural gas infrastructure, we're setting ourselves up for failure. Um, and this isn't we as a, this is we as a, as a society, so it's, it's great to incentivize and maybe there's more we need to do, but I also do, am a little bit concerned going forward that it'll be really hard to tell a major development that they can no longer rely on gas when we've already spent when there have been tens of millions, if not billions of dollars, as we talk nationally on this stuff. So Councilor, if I, please. if I may, I mean, your point's very well taken, and, I, and that's one of the questions or one of the uh, concerns we're, we are going to be addressing or are addressing in our carbon-free Boston Good. project because the, the point is to an, analyze those programs and policies we need to put in place to reach the carbon neutrality goal by 2050. Indeed. How do we do that? in a practical way, both in terms of, you know, the uh, financial sense and in a political sense. How do we structure that conversation? And to that end, thank you for that, Carl. I think that it would be worthwhile reviewing what requirements uh, make something LEED certified, be it platinum or otherwise. I think 20 years ago, having a low-flow toilet and energy-efficient bulb, you know, meant a lot more than it does now. I'm not trying to be, you know, funny about it, but I would say that we have an opportunity as a city, and this could be through the BPDA, it could be through zoning, I'm not entirely sure, but we'll get to that, that we can strengthen the requirements to be LEED certified uh, and what it means to be LEED certified in terms of uh, getting to our goal by 2050. Where are we at our goal for 2020? It was 25% in what's, what's, do you have any idea what the number is now in nearly 2018? Um, our last, we, we are, we expect to release our inventory uh, for 2015, which is the last yep. year of which we have complete data in the next few weeks. Uh, it, uh, we are down, um, I'm sorry, I don't have, it's, a, it's around 13 or 14 percent. So it's, to get to our 2020 goal, it will take a lot of hard work. Uh, it's come up a bit from the low point of three years ago when, when the very good weather and uh, the uh, first, uh, uh, you know, uh, falling gas prices drove, uh, you know, all the remaining coal and oil or most of the out of our energy system. So we had a big reduction there. It's crept up a bit since yeah. then. Anyway, uh, that's where we are now. Like I said, the, uh, the details of the inventory should be out in the next few Good. weeks. Well, I would hazard a guess that everyone in this room is uh, dedicated to working with you and with all of us to make sure that we can meet and exceed that goal in three years. Uh, two quick announcements. Then I want to thank City Councilor at Large, Ayanna Presley, for joining us. Thank you, Councilor Presley. And I think it's an indicative that so many councilors are here. And also, I saw another councilor elect, uh, District 2 City Councilor elect Ed Flynn. Thank you, Councilor elect Flynn, for being here as well. I know both Councilor elect Janie and Flynn. Um, 
uh, have reached out to me and expressed interest in getting to know more about this issue and how important it is. Uh, so we're very grateful that you guys are here as well. Um, Councilor McCarthy, do you have any questions? Just really quickly, uh, Matt, you covered just about everything. There's about $5 billion in shovels in the ground, give or take now. How is our policies now affecting uh, the $5 billion that's in the pipeline? Because we continue to talk about 2030, not 2050, but you know we have construction going on now. So what's the positive, negative effects? Is there any effect? Can you just kind of give me a ballpark uh, explanation of what's going on now? Sure. Um, I will speak to the large projects that are coming under the BPDA review. Um, energy performance is, is a key focus of our review of these projects. And in fact, our review is prompting a number of uh, changes uh, right before our eyes in the industry. And I'll point to uh, a particular nuance, which is building energy modeling. This is how buildings have traditionally demonstrated their compliance with state building energy codes. Um, in Boston, we actually require building energy models early in the project planning process. We do this because we want to understand how the proposed project will perform, but we also do this because we know if you begin measuring building performance up front, you can make better decisions about the building early on. Um, this is a, a new project, we have a new initiative in a certain sense. We haven't seen many projects that have had this kind of robust engagement um, built and, and have performance yet, um, but that will, will come in the next year or two. Um, so that, that's one direct way of how we're affecting uh, practice around energy performance. The other is with the climate change checklist update and zeroing in on the carbon footprint of buildings and asking projects how close to net zero carbon can they get and what can they do in the future to improve the building performance. Um, as you can imagine with some of our larger commercial buildings, especially uh, our, our glass curtain wall uh, systems, which is a, a, a national industry, national practice, um, these types of buildings are gonna be very hard to teach how to be better buildings. And I think we're close to a point where we will start to see uh, more dramatic changes in our large commercial building class as far as the building envelope strategies that, that will support much more efficient buildings and, and especially drive down the cost of heating and cooling these buildings. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you very much. That, that, I know John walks the walk because I see him parking his bike just about every morning in the <laughs> horseshoe. So I know you're part of the, uh, the good side. So thanks. Indeed, thank you, Councilor McCarthy. Councilor Asabi George. I have questions, just find the whole hearing and the information fascinating, thank you. Thank you. Councilor Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, good morning, gentlemen. <clears throat> so like, it, can you explain to me, um, like the new buildings that are going up, anything that you look at here, how, how difficult is it for them to just be LEED certified? Is it not very difficult just using the, new, the newer products that are available now, the building products? Like, like how close, if you're not really sharpening your pencil, would you get to, to being LEED certified on you know, any, any type of building that we see going on? Sure. Um, it's worth noting that the suite of LEED rating systems has recently undergone an upgrade. We now require all projects to comply with version four of the LEED rating system. It's much more rigorous around energy, both in terms of building performance, but also in terms of transportation and other criteria. Uh -huh. So it's been, if you will, reprioritized with much more of a focus on carbon reduction. Um, at this point, um, I would say a code compliant building would probably fall short of meeting LEED certifiable without some measurable efforts. What's a little bit hard is practice normalization. Folks know exactly what we'll accept as a minimum response today. And so by nature, we don't see less. Um, what's really good is by this ongoing dialogue, we see better practices. So even though LEED V4 is rig more rigorous, um, we're seeing projects that are committing to achieving LEED gold um, for instance, especially the larger ones that are um, anticipating greater impacts and greater changes, if you will. Um, like Millennium, Millennium Towers, have you seen that? Yep, and Millennium, and, and we, we are quite fortunate. I mentioned earlier we have a lot to, to thank our building leaders in Boston. Millennium, Boston Properties, 
a number of these large developers have been leading in green building practices. Um, they are, uh, I think, also quite enlightened. We selected the lead rating system because it has a market value dimension to it. So it leaves a lot of opportunity for them to realize by meeting our leadership goals in the marketplace. And so um, that also produces a lot of pressure on our second tier and third tier practitioners. Um, they got to compete with each other. And if they're bringing in buildings that are weak performers, the market will know it and the market will value accordingly. We're seeing this in the existing building sector too. Most, close to half of the lead buildings in Boston are existing buildings, and many of them are our large high-rise buildings, our million square foot towers. These buildings have undergone lead for existing building certification and have seen dramatic reductions in energy use like you um, itemized with Castle Square. We're seeing huge, huge uh, energy performance improvements in really, really big buildings. And this is outside of our regulatory space. This is entirely by market practice. It's intentional. <coughs> but we're not lifting a finger for these um, carbon reduction achievements. Yeah, because there's, there's long-term benefit and then also it looks good on paper. Looks good on paper and it keeps your tenant or gets you the new tenant yeah. you need. And were you saying that the glass buildings, the glass towers are, are the least efficient? Um, glass curtain wall systems have a lot of uh, important functionality in today's large building practice. And curtain wall, you're saying floor to ceiling Floor to ceiling glass, where the building exterior is principally glass panes. Um, there's a lot of beauty to that as well as functionality to that. Um, most use a, a basic curtain wall system that doesn't provide a great deal of insulation along the exterior. Mm -hmm. um, that's not true entirely. We do have buildings like the, Manu the Hancock Manulife building in South Boston that uses a more advanced uh, triple wall system. Uh, but the majority of the buildings that are going up are using a, a double insulated wall system and, and not so a lot. So two pieces of glass in be with insulation yeah. in the middle. Yep. It's, there's more to it. The yeah. glass is coated and treated. It's, it's a much more high performance version than, say, a residential window. Um, but it's not a wall with a significant amount of insulation either. And you talked about um, <clears throat> all electric buildings, and uh, like, so how do we how do we talk to the to the cost there? Like, when you when you're paying electric heat and, and and gas gas heat, it's it's a lot less expensive with gas. So 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 what's happening where the electric yeah. heat is going to come down and make this possible, especially so, in a residential application? Yeah, it's 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 really a. Um, it's really kind of a magic moment, if you'll allow me. Um, we have seen fantastic advances in technology, and in particular in uh, systems called air source heat pumps. They can produce heating from outside air in the coldest of winter days. And they do it much more efficiently than things like electric resistant heating. Mostly, though, we're making our buildings much more efficient, and we can do that with no added cost at this point. Um, we do incur different costs, so we spend more on the building exterior, on the envelope with insulation and the thickness of walls, but we spend a lot less on the building mechanical systems that keep the buildings warm and cool. And then, of course, we spend a lot less heating and cooling the buildings. There are some important synergies here, too, which I think will be uh, significant going forward, and that is building resiliency to climate change. So. What we saw a few winters ago when there was a nice storm in the western part of the state, there were um, net zero homes that spent three, four days without power and were on average losing you know, two or three degrees of interior temperature a day. No heat, no cooling, you know, yeah. just coasting. And that idea- And that's all in the envelope, correct? Yes, and that envelope doesn't go anywhere. So it's a, it's a beautiful thing, actually. And the systems that are supporting it now are, are things you can go to Home Depot and buy. Um, you know, the next time your electric water heater bails out on you, you will probably buy an air source heat pump water heater. It won't cost you any more. The utilities will throw you a bunch of money. It'll save and you'll you. you'll also have on-demand hot water. 
You'll have constant hot water and, and a built-in dehumidifier in your basement to boot. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's amazing to see what products and, pro and, and services are available in the market now that are really driving some of this change. So is, it, is, that, same, <clears throat> is that same type of unit going to trickle down to residential? Because, I mean, it, the, when I think of electric heat, I'm obviously thinking electric in a residential application. Where are we? I mean, I haven't seen any electric boilers yet or, or anything like that. Are those? The, the, this, is, this is the residential scale, and it's probably the most robust practice area right now. And in fact, I think we expect to see the state come out with a package of incentives to further the small residential use of air source heat pump systems and air source hot water, uh, air source heat pump hot water systems. So you'll see those prices come down both on the supply side as manufacturers compete. So just explain so it to me quickly, air source, it's pulling the air in from the outside and if it's heat, it's, it's heating it up, then dispersing it through your house. It's, 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 it's roughly, if you think of an air conditioner working in reverse. Okay. Yep. And, and, and the city of Boston is now working with several other, other cities in New England, including Somerville, Northampton, Providence, and um, Portland, Maine, to, to say how can we bring information about uh, air source heat pumps to the residential community that it can, is most, is in the best place to take advantage of it. So it's actually not homes that have gas, but homes that have oil heating or that have electric resistance heat now, yeah. where using air source heat pumps can provide a cheaper, more efficient, more effective and, source of heating. And if we're using more electricity, <clears throat> how's that electricity being generated? The, uh, the trick here is you, you would actually use less electricity, and especially if- So you're still, you're still using whatever, whatever is, is, um, is making the electricity, but you're using less of it. Yes. Yeah, and, and this, of course, is why we're, you know, uh, you know, here in Boston and, and, you know, and the Commonwealth, of course, is doing a huge amount of work in this area, working to increase the supply of renewable energy in the electric grid. Yeah. And so it, it benefits from that in the long term as the grid becomes uh, greener. Okay. And last question would be, are there any cities in, in the country that are um, kind of applying this sort of methodology towards residential now already? Like, like mandating that new residences are LEED certified or like is there any, is there any pockets yeah. in the country that are, that are looking at residential for this sort of stuff? Yeah, the, uh, I think the leadership space right now is back to California. Used to be here. Um, it'll be here again. Um, where uh, they have on the books now uh, net zero small residential requirements for 2020. Yeah. So and by 2020, all new small residential in California will have to be net zero energy. And, and cities like Portland, uh, Boulder, Colorado is yeah. doing a lot of work with air source heat pumps. And we are, we are talking, uh, you know, with our colleagues in those, in those cities to see exactly what they're doing, understanding what's working, what's not working, so we can bring yeah. it here to Boston. So California state law, all of California is going to, for, for, for residentials by 2020? By 2020. All new building. All new small and then will there be a retrofit in behind that for um, what, existing? Well, you'll probably see the way we usually scale in practice is with small residential, then large residential, and small commercial, and then we'll, we'll yeah, continue yeah. to scale up. And just quick note on, on the, the, um, the heat pumps, the air, the air intake heat pumps. How long have they been around in a residential application? Um, the, the use of air source heat pumps for heating has probably been around close to 10 years now. What's dramatically different is the number of suppliers, the cost, and the fact that you can simply go to Home Depot and buy these things. It, you know, that and might not be the right thing for you, but they're plentiful. Um, there's a lot more types and a lot more variety of, of the product available. So it's getting you know, much more user friendly. With our E plus buildings, our biggest challenge initially was buying systems that were small enough. Even the smallest systems were oversized for the needs we have with these high performance homes. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you, no, Mr. Great questions, uh, Councilor Baker, and thank you. And I would only liken that um, you know, despite the outward hostility in Washington, the market is really stepping up here. To that point about heat pumps, I'd say the same thing with electric cars. Ten years ago, very few people could afford them, but because 
of an increased awareness as well as some incentives from both the private and the public sector, you're seeing more and more people use it. So that's why yeah. this is a very so timely and exciting. Sometimes when you're, when you're on, the, like if you're the first person to use one of those burners, it it fails on you in two years. If you waited the five years, you get a better exactly. burner. So I think I, I, if I haven't really heard about them, um, people using them, then uh, you know my sense is that they're a little while away from from coming into wide use in in residential. Would that be safe to say? You're you're well into the safe zone. Okay, good. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Councillor Presley. So much, and uh, thank you, Councilor O'Malley, uh, for your steadfast leadership in this space. I thank my colleagues for their robust line of questioning. I had a lot of questions in the residential space, so I'll shift. I just wanted to ask a question. Uh, my colleagues and I just uh, came from, uh, and we thank uh, the Mass Municipal Research Bureau for hosting us uh, annually. And um, I was sharing a statistic at the lunch that uh, in 2030, 85 percent of the jobs um, uh, that will exist then haven't even been invented yet which begs a larger question in terms of readiness. So in the space of green jobs um, and readiness of our students and our workforce, et cetera, um, I'm just curious, um, uh, you know, because I think for a long time issues in this space were seen as uh, so forward uh, thinking and progressive and now they're just, uh, you know, critically necessary in the present and also for our future. Uh, and so from a workforce and economy side, I was wondering if you could speak to that, if we have any sense of how many green jobs we currently have right now and as we continue to uh, have these um, uh, address the challenges relative to a skills gap. Um, how do we address that? When you talk about the number of products and services, I'm just wondering where they're being manufactured and who has those jobs and how many more jobs we have and stand to create. Sure. Um, let me, I can speak to a couple of points on this. Sure. And the, um, I think the interesting conversation around the <laughs> greening of the economy um, and the idea that we would be creating uh, a vast number of new green jobs is getting rethought. What we're doing is we're greening jobs the way we are greening buildings. The knowledge and expertise gap remains and so it's being re-understood. It's a lot more about helping our, our, our young apprentices and journeymen who are moving into the trades get the training when they're, they're young so they can show up as that new employee with the new needed expertise. And it's about training the people who are running our buildings to be more expert at running the buildings the way they're being built now. Um, I mentioned earlier we have great partners who have helped us in all of this work and it's worth mentioning the uh, USGBC Massachusetts Council is here. Um, our executive director Meredith Ebaum is here and the um, chapter has been leading in an effort um, that was recently awarded I think about $250,000 for uh, job training in this specific area with a, a focus toward our, our younger practitioners, uh, recent high school graduates in particular. Um, it's a consortium of practitioners and I can't speak knowledgeably about all the aspects of it, but it's very much on, on our radar and I think it's, it's an incredible opportunity um, to grow our economy right here by keeping resources here. We're not buying oil from wherever we get it from. We're, we're using our human resources and our natural resources much more efficiently right here. And so we create a cycle where we all benefit better. So um, that's very much at the forefront of our thinking. And I know the BPDA through the um, Office of Workforce Development is looking at job training in this area as well. Sure. And I mean, you know, certainly if we're talking about um, uh, if you will, a, uh, a retraining of people that are already in the industry or, you know, in construction or in the trade, certainly that, you know, begs a larger question and concern relative to equity and opportunity for these jobs. Um, you know, so certainly at the fore of my mind is, you know, Madison Park High School and also that we're not only thinking about our youth, um, but people mid-career. You know, we have a real skills gap and, and unemployment, uh, you know, issue here. And we do want to make sure that those that are in the greatest need and also who are the most vulnerable to environmental justice issues are having an opportunity to um, be a part of this economy and this workforce. Um, so uh, just uh, if, if you can't at this time provide me with the number and I'll, I'll think it, maybe you could advise me as to who to follow up with, but do we know right now how many green jobs we have and where the lion's share of them are, sort of what's the geography and who has them? I, 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 we, why don't we get that information for you? Okay, I, I know the, uh, some of the line. research folks at the BPDA have, been, have looked at that and other okay. folks too. No, we, we are, and just as another example, you know, we are very concerned about retraining. Uh, we are actually, 
as sort of a pilot program looking at how do we retrain the facilities manage the building managers of the city of Boston oh, so that they are ready to you know run the new systems uh, uh, in and, and make sure that our HVAC systems our electrical systems Excellent. are working most in the most efficient way and uh, we are working with our partners at the utilities and and some other uh, partners to establish that kind of training program again for the city of Boston's own employees and that and that as a demonstration of how to take it to, uh, you know, to the private sector. Well, too. I'm encouraged to hear that and look forward to continue to have the conversation and to be a partner with you um, in that, you know, not only does our very planet uh, depend on this, uh, certainly our workforce does as well. So we don't want to leave anyone behind. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Presley. Council President Wu. Thank you. Um, Apologies again I, for stepping out. So um, if you've already covered all this, just let me know and I'll, I'll watch the video. Um, um, are there any plans in, um, in terms of the administrations looking at 2050 to seek legislative tools to, to specifically around net zero or carbon free, either at the state level or the city level to codify some of that? First, uh, you know, as I mentioned in our carbon-free Boston uh, analysis, we want to identify exactly what tools we think we're going to need, and it's possible that we will uh, look for some uh, legislative steps. But right now, we haven't sort of laid out the uh, the steps that we want to take. And when will? So, do you say next fall? Uh, the the carbon-free Boston analysis uh, should be completed this summer, and then it will become one of the uh, foundations for the update of the climate action plan which will represent the actual the policy decisions that we want to make and there, you know there there may be regulatory and legislative tools that uh, are uh, recommended through that process and that's the that's for 2019 the climate action plan update okay um, so what would you think about adopting a California like rule at the city level um, say for 2030 or 2020? Well, again, it, it all depends on the details. You know, in, in principle, obviously, we, we want to find ways to, uh, you know, to encourage uh, better building performance and to uh, require better building performance as, as necessary. Part of that comes through the, the, uh, the ratcheting up of the state building code, which is revised every three years. Part of it through the mechanism of the updating of the lead requirements. As John mentioned, we're now in version four of leads and the requirements become tougher. And then again, we'll see what, uh, we'll be evaluating what additional measures we uh, might want to take. Okay, great. Um, well, again, just want to reiterate my perspective that I think changing the framework and the sort of bargaining or incentives that the private sector is dealing with uh, is, is really the fastest and only way to, to ensure that we're gonna get there. Um, so we'll be pushing ideally even sooner than the timeline of, of 2019 to, to get to the conversation about legal tools and um, how we begin to take back the leadership from the West Coast on this issue. Thank you. Here, here. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, thank you to our good colleague and friend at large, City Councilor Michael Flaherty, for joining us. Uh, Michael will do the last questions for this round before we get to the uh, experts. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Matt. And uh, good to see Kyle and, and John here. Just a quick question. Uh, what progress have we made with respect to reaching our um, carbon neutrality goal of 2050? Well, um, uh, uh, since 2005, uh, we're down about 13% uh, uh, in 2015. As, as I uh, mentioned before you came in, Councillor, uh, the uh, 2015 greenhouse gas inventory, we should be able to release all the data uh, and final results in the, in the next few weeks, and, and we'll certainly make sure you all get a copy when that's released. Okay. Uh, would that be in, in December or that it's going to be in January? Well, I, I am eager to get it out, so we will, we will get it out as fast as we can. I, I can't give you a definite date at this point. Must be good news if you're eager to get it out, really so that's nice. helpful. <laughs> I am. I am very eager okay. to get it out. Well, can you make sure that the chair gets a copy, maybe Absol an advanced copy? That would be great. Absolutely. Thank you, Carl. Okay. Thank you. So, gentlemen, if you don't mind, so you, thank you both. You've agreed to stay to hear from the experts. If you just want to grab those two seats or those two seats, whichever pleasure. Uh, and I'd like to invite down Christopher Schaffner, uh, Jaina Silsby, Bob Biggio, and Joan Fitzger Professor Joan Fitzgerald, if you could just join these four. And uh, thank you all for coming.
and you can line up in whichever order I think you may have already determined, so, however. Thank you, ladies, gentlemen. Um, who would like to start? I'd just maybe introduce yourself, your organization, any opening th thoughts, and then we'll get to uh, some Q&A. So. I believe I'm supposed to start. Yeah, thank, you. thank you very much. Good afternoon. I'm Jana Silsby. I'm a principal at Perkins Eastman, which is a global architecture firm, but we have a Boston office right up at 20 Ashburton Place. Our work encompasses pretty much all market sectors of buildings and master planning, and we are signatories to the AIA 2030 commitment. I'm a regi registered architect of 25 years, and for the past 15 years, I've been focused on highly energy efficient, high performance buildings, including those targeting net zero. And since you recognized Mayor Davis, I will say that I was the principal designer and project architect for their first school in their Green Schools Initiative, the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. School Project. Um, I think that from my perspective as an architect, I want to say that it is possible. We have the technology here today to make Boston a net zero carbon um, city and that every day there is an increasing number of projects within the Commonwealth of Massachusetts that are both net zero com carbon as well as net zero energy. And um, I've been asked to actually just start with a bit of a definition of what those two things mean and the differences. Um, a net zero energy building is a highly energy efficient building where on a source energy basis, the actual energy delivered is less than or equal to the renewable energy exported. In simple terms, this means that the building produces as much energy as it consumes. Now, a net zero carbon building is slightly different in that it is a highly energy efficient building that produces on site or procures enough carbon free renewable energy to meet the building's energy and energy consumption. So in either case, the first step that is very important to net zero is to reduce energy consumption. Um, that is where I, as an architect, focus my efforts in the K-12 projects that I do. Um, I've achieved 70% lower energy use than the national average, and the way that uh, my project teams have done that is first by setting energy goals with clients early at the beginning of a highly integrated process. Utilizing best practices for massing and solar orientation and daylighting control. And then through an airtight exterior fenestration with high insulating values. And I might also add appropriate window to wall ratios. Um, and then highly energy efficient systems for heating, cooling, ventilating, lighting, and food preparation that are integrated, working collaboratively with engineers, users, and owners. Um, we use energy modeling throughout the process to inform our design decisions so that we make ensure that we are making smart and um, cost effective decisions. But it is also important that buildings are properly operated, maintained, and tracked so that they continue to be highly efficient through the years. Once these measures are taken, renewable energy sources can provide the relatively small energy demands for these buildings. The design and engineering community welcomes thoughtful and practical challenges to improve the buildings that we design. And we are confident that such actions will result in buildings that cost less to operate pollute less and are more resilient in extreme weather events. As design professionals, we encourage the public sector to both require and incentivize actions which move the city towards carbon neutrality. We applaud the council's leadership on this issue and we stand ready to support you. And I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you, I think we'll do other opening statements and we'll get to questions, but appreciate that overview. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, I'm Bob Biggio. I'm the Senior Vice President of Facilities for Boston Medical Center. I'd like you to thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Boston Medical Center is a proud leader in the area of environmental sustainability. And we'd like, we're honored to share our experience with you. Um, this past year, we've been recognized by Practice Green Health as one of the top 25 hospitals for environmental excellence in the United States, and by Becker's Hospital Review as being one of the top 50 greenest hospitals in the nation. As of today, BMC has achieved an 80% reduction in greenhouse gas uh, emissions from its building energy, and we are on pace to be carbon net neutral by 2019. Wow. While this may seem like an extraordinary accomplishment for a large ur urban academic medical center, what we have found while on this journey is that these efforts have improved the resiliency and the quality of our facilities while simultaneously reducing the total energy spend by nearly 50%. 
These efforts were multifaceted. First and foremost came an in-depth space planning analysis, which focused on maximizing the utilization, or perhaps better described as the productivity, of the own square footage of our buildings. This process led us to launch our campus redesign plan, which consolidates our current two campuses into one, thereby eliminating space redundancies, which were necessitated by the two campus configuration. The end result provided us with a roadmap to reduce our campus square footage by nearly 400,000 square feet, while simultaneously growing the capacity to see patients across most of our service lines. For example, our emergency department, which was already the busiest in New England, will expand its capacity by nearly 30%. In addition, the square footage the consolidation liberated was sold from the BMC portfolio, stimulating at least half a billion dollars of outside investment into our South End neighborhood. In close partnership with Eversource, we have invested in high efficiency HVAC systems, LED lighting, the installation of a two megawatt cogeneration plant. The cogeneration plant not only reduces our energy costs by 1.5 million annually, but, as, but we are the first hospital in the state to have black start and islanding capabilities to allow us to continue to power and heat our facilities in the event of a natural disaster, such as Superstorm Sandy in New York or Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. This installation was made possible by a grant from the Department of Energy Resources, which we applied for in collaboration with the City of Boston and Boston Public Health Commission. And finally, environmentally conscious procurement has played an extremely important role in our success. We entered into a long-term green steam contract with Veolia, which shifted our supply of district steam consumption over to co-generated steam. And then the largest contributor to our greenhouse gas emissions reduction can be attributed to working with a, be working with a better city, to collaborate with Post Office Square Garage and MIT, to enter into the largest collaborative power purchase agreement for solar power ever executed in the United States. This contract produces power which is equivalent to 100% of Boston Medical Center's expected electric consumption upon the completion of our campus redesign plan. Thank you. Well, well done, Bob. I, th I think there can be uh, clap hands for that. That's amazing what you're doing at BMC. I'm grateful for that. Thank you. Thank you. Christopher? Yeah, so tough act to follow. Um, <laughs> my, my name is uh, Chris Schaffner. I'm the president and founder of a company called The Green Engineer. We're a sustainable design consulting firm. And uh, to the earlier counselor's question about green jobs, we were one person in 2005. Today we're 18 people and we're hiring. And we're not unique. There are lots of businesses like ours that have uh, grown as part of the green economy. Uh, I'm a mechanical engineer. I'm a registered professional engineer in the state of Massachusetts. I served on Mayor Menino's uh, green Building Task Force Advisory Committee and also on Governor Patrick's uh, Net Zero Energy Building Task Force. And uh, I work on a lot of the buildings in Boston. My clients include people like Boston Properties and Skanska and Tishman Spire and uh, Fallon Companies, people like that who are building the seaport and a lot of the big buildings in town. Uh, and I want to make four real key points about uh, where we are on things like uh, carbon-free buildings. I think that the biggest takeaway is that buildings have a long life. So whereas a, a, a car or a consumer appliance uh, in 2030, the car you buy now is probably on its last legs, the decisions we make on a building today are going to affect the consumption of energy of that building for the next 30, 50, perhaps 100 years. And the time to put uh, the efficiency measures in is now when we're designing it and building it initially. It's much more cost effective. It can be often done at no additional cost if we do it now. And so the biggest impact is at the beginning, not as a retrofit. And so we talk a lot about net zero source energy, net zero site energy, net zero carbon. Net zero energy is a really worthy goal, and it's something that some buildings are able to achieve, but it's difficult for many building types. But what's really important is that we create buildings that use energy efficiently and are supplied with energy from carbon-free sources. So as the grid gets greener, as we were talking about, if we have buildings that have decarbonized uh, that are using electricity for their heating and all of their needs, uh, we're going to get to net zero carbon as a community, as a city, as a region, as a country, as a world, which is really what we're trying to get to. Um, so uh, targeting net zero carbon now for new buildings is going to encourage greater building energy efficiency, first of all. We're going to build that savings into these buildings from the beginning and move us away from trying to heat our buildings with fossil fuels. Um, 
and it's going to increase the demand for renewable energy. When you look at things like the, what Boston Medical Center has done, what that's doing is increasing the supply of renewable energy for everyone. So we are greening the grid and getting to a better place. And the technologies are viable today. Uh, we can decarbonize the heat, the air source heat pumps that, that John Delzell mentioned. Um, these, we're putting these in everywhere uh, these days. They're, they're, they're really very, very, uh, uh, very viable. And the fourth point that, that was raised uh, in the previous round of speakers about the city already having a requirement for LEED. That's a great thing that we, we do that. Uh, but the fact is that LEED is not actually keeping up with where we need to, to be. Uh, the state base energy code, never mind the stretch code, the state base energy code is already more stringent than the minimum requirements of LEED. So to be simply a LEED certified building, in our office we say in Boston you roll out of bed and you're LEED certified. Uh, we, we don't think it's really that big a deal. We, we need a higher bar. Um, so I look forward to your questions and I'm, again, thank you very much for having the opportunity to speak to you. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate it. Professor? Counselors, for the opportunity. My name is Joan Fitzgerald. I'm a professor in the School of Public Policy and Urban Affairs at Northeastern University. I teach a graduate course called City Sustainable, Sustainability and Climate Change, and several of you in the room have been speakers in that course. Um, my last book was called Emerald Cities, where I focused on the link between economic development and a city sustainability plan, and I'll be publishing one next year called Green Ovation, Urban Leadership on Climate Action. I focus on European and North American cities, <clears throat> looking at replicable policies. And one area, of course, is how do we get to zero net energy buildings and also 100% renewable energy. So in the couple minutes I have, I'd just like to say a few things about different approaches to getting there. One is interim policies and thinking about making sure you're establishing a successful base one is to do piloting at the district scale, going beyond the building scale to do it. And then the one is looking at partnerships with developers. So let me start with Vancouver, um, where I was just on the phone this morning uh, with people about uh, how they're implementing their plans. Vancouver has a renewable city strategy with a goal to get to 100% renewable energy, along with a zero emissions energy plan. What that means in practice for, say, a condo going up like many of those in Boston is that right now it has to meet two targets, one having to do with the thermal energy demand between 32 and 40 kilowatt hours per square meter per year um, for heating and 25 to 35 for hot water, uh, a very ambitious goal for greenhouse gas emissions that is six kilograms per square meter per year. So just to give you an example of where that's moving Vancouver, it's toward the complete electrification of buildings as we talked about, or we heard about in the previous panel. And that's really important for a city like Vancouver because all of its, almost all of its electricity comes from hydropower. So if you're all electric, you're all green. So two if you're all electric, six on natural gas. Now, someone asked about natural gas companies. Needless to say, their natural gas utility isn't happy with this. And so one of the things they've done along the way is negotiate with the, with the utility about developing what's called renewable natural gas, biogases, but doing it in a way where they can cost share with the cheaper natural gas so that they can implement this new technology. The other thing um, that they're doing in terms of rehabilitation in Vancouver is zero ready as an interim step. And this is building something that can get to zero net energy, but doesn't right now. And part of the reason they're doing it is what they're doing is anticipating the changes that will be necessary in the building codes and then working with the developers so they can get ready to doing that because it does require new techno um, construction technologies. So I think that is a strategy that anticipates all of the regulatory as well as um, just construction technologies that are going to be needed. At the district scale, um, we heard in the last panel very briefly about, about um, Fort Zed in Fort Collins, Colorado. This is an area of two miles square, 15% of the electricity load of the city. 
And what they're doing is building to zero net energy standard there. But I think what happens when you move to the district scale from the building scale is it allows them to look at integration of distributed systems. So what this is about is moving energy from one building to another, from one area to the other, so you can actually shave peak demand as, as part of the process of getting to zero net energy. There's a lot of software that needs to be tested to do this, a lot of different technologies. So this is a public-private partnership between many software companies. So in addition, speaking to the economic development question, they're developing the technologies of the future that are going to build that zero net energy. So before I mentioned about the construction community, the development community, uh, another city I follow closely is Malmo, Sweden. And one of the things that they have done realizing that the building community needs to learn this is to establish this living building partnership. And so if a developer wants to build in that city, the city will say to them, okay, we're expecting you to build to say 85 kilowatt hours per square meter per year. And the developers will say, I don't know how to do that. And they say, well, we're going to learn. And so at each step, the various developers and construction companies are learning the new technologies, experimenting, finding out what learn, what works and what doesn't. So um, just if I may, one more quick one, because I think um, there's a social justice connection to this is all, at all, that we should be building low income uh, green housing as well. And um, there's a, a person uh, his last name is O'Connell, who's developing in Philadelphia passive house standard affordable housing. Um, this is for the lowest income populations. Passive house just means no external heating or cooling systems required. He's figured out a way to do this at only about 2 to 3 percent above what it would cost to, be re uh, to do regular heating. And New York State is following this pattern as well. So my point in this is that right now there are cities and states that are building to these standards and learning how to build better to these standards and we should look to them um, as where we need to go in Boston. Well said. Thank you very much, Professor. I wanted to acknowledge we've been joined uh, by our good friend, the District 9 City, eight, nine city Council, District 9 City Councilor Mark Siomo. Thank you, Councilor Siomo. Um, and I again want to thank the BCEC for helping to put together this phenomenal panel. You guys covered so much important stuff. You talked about the possible, you talked about the practical, you talked about the political, and it was really, really uh, impressive. A couple of quick questions. Um, Bob, I know the answer to this question, but I'm asking it anyway. How much, because uh, I love the answer, how much money is BMC going to uh, uh, project to save annually on energy and operation costs once you get to net zero? So it's, a, it's about $8 million annually. $8 million annually. Phenomenal. Now, I don't know the answer to this question, and I'm asking it anyway. Ta I assume a large part of why, in all likelihood, one year from now, BC, uh, BMC is going to reach its goal has been the co-generational. Can you talk about co-generation? Can you talk about what it is, why it's important, how, it, how it's been able to be a successful part of this sort of portfolio that you put forward? So the, the Co-generation plant is a, it is a natural gas-fired engine that's on the roof of our Yaki building, which bridges Mass Ave. Um, and it, it essentially allows us to generate um, about 20% of our power on site at, at a peak period. And um, it's about 35% more efficient, 35% uh, more efficient than uh, traditional power because when you generate uh, uh, electricity in, in a power plant, normally the heat is extracted to atmosphere whereas generating it on site allows us to utilize that heat to both heat our facility as well as, uh, you know, for process loads uh, that we have within the hospital. That's great. That's impressive. Um, and is it, um, what's the percentage that it generates, 35 percent of your? It's about 35 percent more efficient, more, and it generates about 20 to 25 percent of the power at a peak period. And forgive my ignorance, if, if you had more space to build something bigger, would that 20 percent number increase? Is it? So we, we could have gone larger. However, the, the key to getting maximum efficiency is to be able to use that heat on a year-round basis. 
And most buildings, uh, hospitals and lab buildings, generate a lot of heat even in the summer months. I see. And so it's sized in order to, to match that heat load during the summer months so that we get maximum efficiency. Excellent. And have any of the other great institutions and hospitals and sort of LMA and elsewhere reached out to you to say, hey, we want to do this too? Uh, yes, they have. Good. You've been looking at it. Glad to hear it. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, Chris, you've been in this space working here for a while. Um, you know, we talked briefly the other day, and I've, I've sort of done a little research. So talk about how technology has changed, and I guess the, the question is, do we need technology to continue to change and wait to sort of implement some of these things? So yeah, I, th I think that's, that's a great question. I was at a I think at Northeastern actually a couple years ago, the energy conference, and somebody from Northeastern who's not here spoke up and said that you students are going to invent the things that, that fix our future, basically. And I walked away from that very upset, and I, I teach part-time at Northeastern. I told my students there, no, that's exactly wrong. We have all the tools right now, uh, the technology like LED lighting, the air source heat pumps, uh, the advanced building automation systems, the uh, double, triple skin facades with electrochromic glazing that can shade itself, all the smart building technology, all the renewables at a nice low price now compared to where we used to be. Uh, the time is now to do this. Uh, there's no reason to wait. Yes, there will be new innovations and things will continue to improve, but we've got everything we need to reach any of these goals right now. Fantastic, well said. And then for, for um, Jana and, and Joan, can you talk about uh, what you've sort of seen in the private sector in your experience as an architect and what you've studied, you referenced a couple of other cities, um, incentives that some cities have u utilized, be it a change of, oh, for question of that, who sets the lead code, who set, is that, is that a federal, so we, we set it, who sets lead, what, what is considered so, lead certified? So lead is, lead comes from the U.S. Green Building Council, yeah. which is a, uh, independent nonprofit, yeah. uh, and it operates on a consensus basis. I'm a volunteer. I'm actually on the LEED steering committee. Yeah. We're working on LEED version 4.1. Right so right now. now we're using LEED 4.0, Right, correct? and 4.1 doesn't exist yet. We're okay. using the latest and greatest. Uh, but the, the issue that LEED has is they're trying to be applicable everywhere. And so they want people to use this system not just in Massachusetts, but places like Alabama. And, and you, I think either you or Bob mentioned that right now this, the state-based energy code is more stringent that's than correct. what sort of the basic LEED certified the state, is. The base energy code is about 5% more stringent than LEED's minimum requirements okay. for energy. So now, it, uh, if you're a LEED platinum building, that's still a major achievement. Sure. That's a lot, and LEED covers a lot of things besides energy. But just on that energy piece, we can't rely on LEED as a requirement alone to get us where we need to be. So is LEED 4.1? Is it, you guys going to make it tougher? There's an ongoing debate, and it's yeah. a consensus process. There are people advocating for different levels of carbon uh, reduction at different levels of certification. Yeah. That may be something that happens. Certainly the bar will get raised as building codes change. But right now, uh, you know, and, and the, the hard part is, too, that a lot of projects that are actually under construction right now are still using the previous version of LEED because they went for their initial permitting back three, four, or five years ago before that new version came along. Can we make natural gas a deal breaker with LEED certified? Uh, LEED, LEED has no preference for one utility okay. uh, source or another. All right. All right, back to, to Joan and uh, Jana. Um, what have you seen uh, sort of from the business perspective and then from sort of best practices? What tools or incentives have other cities used to move us to net zero or to move their cities that we could perhaps implement to move to net zero? If either wants to f jump in first. Well, I, I think the idea of the need to get the private sector on board, I mean, you, you often hear people in city government say, well, we can't tell developers what to do. Um, and, and one of the approaches that I, I see throughout the United States is something that was developed by an organization called Architecture 2030 with these 2030 districts where you get almost all of the building owners and managers in a downtown district to agree to not net zero yet, but to very high levels of uh, energy efficiency, water efficiency, and transportation. And what I like about this approach is that it's, it's voluntary, but it really gets the business community on board. And it's, it's Seattle was the first one, but it's not just the Seattles, it's the Pittsburgh and Cleveland ones that are really moving. And so it's kind of a combination of not doing so much regulation that, 
the private sectors, you know, developers are screaming about it, but getting them on board and having having them be partners in doing it is is very effective. Thank you. I, and I, here in um, Cambridge, I'm very most familiar with Cambridge. I have to admit because I've worked with them as a, a long-term client. They have incentives that are built into their um, program, including like incentives for height and area. Um, I have to say, though, that most of the cities that are doing the most amazing things, I mean, even including like Washington, D.C., which is the first lead platinum city, um, is that they're actually leading by example. It's getting the municipal buildings on board first to show that it can be done and doing it at costs that are right in the middle of the averages for buildings of similar type that are being built at that time. And I think that so it's not just standing back and letting the developers, you know, wrestle with it. It's also showing them this can be done. It can be done at scale. And even right here in Boston, I mean, you know, one of our early Boston projects was the Radiant, which is a lead gold 26-story housing project that Forest City did. Um, and now we're actually continuing that relationship down in D.C. with them where we're actually, you know, increasing, even though it's version 4, we're increasing our goals and our energy efficiency, and they're actually also looking at well. So there's, which is another um, building standard. Um, so I think that it's by example, and it's, the, the devil is in the details of a building. I know a lot of people talk about the gizmos and gadgets that you can add to a building to make it energy efficient. But I think that one of the things that we like to do as a mindset is let's pretend we don't have systems. Let's pretend that it is that uh, you know, event when all the power goes out. How can we design a building that doesn't essentially can exist without systems? And then we integrate the systems. We do the best envelope we possibly can. Again, reiterating what Chris said, you invest the dollars in the things that last. Let's not invest in a system that's going to have a 20-year lifespan, which is what most mechanical systems are at. Let's invest in that envelope. Let's put in the triple glazing. Let's you know, do the better envelope. Let's have, like the, again, the city of Cambridge, they actually measure the gross floor area of a building to the outside face of the sheathing, not the outside face of the finished material. The reason they did that is they did not want high performance envelopes with a lot of insulation to be penalized. So your gross floor area is at that sheathing and then if you add four inches of insulation or five inches of insulation or whatever it is, it still is back at that point of the sheathing so everybody is on a level playing field and you're not penalized. Smart. So, so a couple takeaways from that: cities need to lead by example. Obviously, there are some incentives, and just that's it. I had never even thought of that, but doing that can can be different. Um, the third point I would say, and I've said this to some members of the BCEC, is it's incumbent upon us as well as members of the community. We often Boston is in its third bil biggest building boom. I know from my vantage point, Councilor Flaherty and every councilor who is here, whenever a new large scale, or even small scale development comes. It's a lengthy community process, which is important. Often there's asked for increased affordability and a trade-off on density, also important mitigation for the community. But I would also argue that as all of us as residents, we need to start asking for more uh, net zero carbon buildings as well. And that should, be a, that should be part of the community process in terms of what we want to see built in our neighborhoods and outside of the downtown. So thank you for that. Um, that's all I have. Do you have questions, Councillor Flaherty? Same, same wavelength, uh, Mr. Chairman, on the tools and incentives, because I think that's one of the issues that's probably less with developers and more with landlords. When you think about our stock, um, you know, it's old bones here. A lot of our Class A buildings uh, are 40, 50 years old. Some are older, and, and our Class B space is even older than that. So I, from your personal experience, professional experience, what cost-effective methods uh, are out there? I mean, because I would assume that the landlord is going to cite cost uh, in order to retrofit the building uh, to be car carbon neutral. So, uh, and that's probably going to be the biggest resistance, I think. The new construction stuff, they've got, got a pretty good handle on it. Clearly the city, the mayor's office, the you know, BRA, and the council working with community leaders kind of have a, a good handle on the new stuff coming out of the ground. But if you think about the old bones here in Boston, mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of old buildings. Uh, and in order to get those buildings retrofitted, that's a conversation with the landlord to Matt's point on the incentives and, and the tools out there. But off the top of your head, are there any immediate sort of cost-effective uh, ways to reduce the carbon footprint? Well, I, I, I think a couple of things. One, I think the Birdo uh, does quite a bit for the larger buildings. Uh, what we find is that people often even don't realize how efficient or inefficient their buildings are until they compare it to others. And when you find out you're consuming twice as much energy as your neighbor, you're more motivated to do something. 
It's always more difficult to do things as a retrofit because there's an alternative of doing nothing that has zero first cost. And so to get some kind of payback on investment is, is tougher, especially when we're looking at things like improving building envelope. Um, you know, I think one of the, the things that we've learned is that you can identify low-hanging fruit fairly easily and that there's a lot of third-party funding available to help do that, especially, especially the utilities. Uh, and uh, there's also third-party funding for doing things like getting off of oil heat and putting in uh, air source heat pumps uh, available from the Mass CEC. And it was mentioned earlier, another program coming out in January from, uh, from the state with the alternative energy credits. So I think that uh, figuring out a way to get people into those buildings to look at how much energy they're actually consuming and tackling to start with the low-hanging fruit is something that can be very cost-effective and, and useful. And I'll say that, you know, programs like Mass Save and things like that are actually have done a tremendous amount to help finance, you know, things like putting um, insulation into attics and that sort of thing. And utilizing and understanding where is your energy, like how much is your lighting versus how much is your heating and that sort of thing is really important. One of the things that we always talk about first with our client is having an energy budget. People understand that they have to live within in their means for a financial budget, but I bet you most people, guaranteed most people, have no idea what their energy budget should be for their house, what it is today, and what it should be. And I think that having those kind of conversations and utilizing you know, funding sources that provide that investigation is as important as then actually providing the insulation so that they're actually able to impact the things that are actually causing them to spend the most energy. I mean, I think that in this day and age, the you know um, LED lighting has made huge impact on the lighting, and lighting actually is a much smaller percent of the pie now. So our next steps isn't focusing on lighting. Our next steps needs to be focusing on those heating sources, you know, and heating systems. And our next steps need to be focusing on then the envelope and those types of things, especially when you're talking about the simple residential um, you know projects that don't have a lot of other types of systems working in their buildings, like a hospital does. You know, to, to build on your point about um, uh, that, uh, the energy budget, um, people aren't aware, but even as, as good as Mass Save is and what it's done, the take up rate on these energy efficiency programs is not particularly good, even with all the subsidy. And because energy is such a small part of the budget, um, unless you're, you know, low income, it's just not very motivating. So some cities have done some interesting things to build public awareness. Uh, New Castle, Australia strikes me is that in their downtown, they have a huge billboard that shows on-time energy usage. And they have divided the city in districts that they're actually competing with each other about who can be the most energy efficient district. They have schools where the education programs are built around competing for which one can reduce their energy consumption. So um, we, we've got a long ways to go on, on getting people to buy into energy efficiency, even when it's highly subsidized. And I think that building as a teaching tool in the schools is something that we focus a lot at. And that um, grant um, program that is, um, you know, from the uh, Green Build Legacy Project at, uh, I'm now blanking on the school, it's their tech program. Um, that's one place where we're actually, there, the city of Boston is working to teach people, but also even in the Boston Arts Academy, which I'm actually happen to be doing that project as well. Thank you very much, by the way, for voting for it. Um, um, we actually are working with them. They have a highly advanced STEAM program and working with them to expose systems and to expose even the wall construction and to teach those kids to have a different relationship with energy so they know how the systems work and how the buildings work, even for just the general like science program, not necessarily because they're gonna go into the building sciences or anything like that, but just because we all live in buildings. The other thing I wanna point out about having really highly efficient buildings is that they're more comfortable. I mean, people don't talk about that, but actually having these better envelopes and having these better systems means that your air quality is better, your, you know, the thermal performance of a, of a really great window means that it's not drafty and you don't have, you know, have all of that heat gain in the summertime and you don't have all that draft in the wintertime. They're more comfortable and that actually reduces stress and makes people feel better. It definitely improves test scores when you have that connection to daylight in an appropriate way and not too much glass. 
you actually have an appropriate amount of gla glass that has distributed light and really makes it a wonderful space to be in and to, to learn and to live. And it's the same whether it's housing, it's the same whether it's higher ed, and it's the same whether it's healthcare. Um, doing things appropriately also just improve people's lives. Fantastic. Thank you. Well, thank you all. That was very illuminating. I really appreciate it. I do want to be respectful of everyone's time, um, so thank you for that. Uh, we have one more panel of uh, some terrific advocates who I'd like to invite forward. You can clap for them. They were great. They deserved it. Uh, I'd like to call up uh, four advocates. Uh, Carol Oldham from the Boston Clean Energy Coalition, Andy Krasner from Mothers Out Front, Reverend Mariama White-Hammond, uh, and Dr. Britta Lundberg. So please join us up here. Uh, after the conclusion of this panel, we will then get to uh, public testimony. I appreciate everyone's, um, thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay, I don't believe so, thank you. Um, and thank you to Peter Fox Penner, Executive Director, Institute for Sustainable Energy at BU. Appreciate your time. Um, this is, uh, we, we will make sure our colleagues have copies of this, uh, of this testimony. Thank you very much, but appreciate your going forward. Thank you. So who's uh, starting for this illustrious group? Please, I think Andy. I'm going to start. Thank you. Uh, before I begin, I just want to start by recognizing the great work that the City Council has done this year thank to you. pass both Community Choice Energy and banning the plastic bags. I want to encourage the whole council, you two <laughs> here to hear me say it, um, to continue to be bold in your climate action. Thank you. My name is Andy Krasner. I'm a resident of Boston and a volunteer with Mothers Out Front. We're working for a livable climate for our kids. I have two children, six-year-old Jonah, who loves Harry Potter, and nine-year-old Maya, who loves to bake. As a mother, the health and safety of Jonah and Maya and their future well-being are always on my mind. I make sure my kids wear bicycle helmets and eat five fruits and vegetables a day, and every day I oversee them brush and floss their teeth. I don't know about those of you with kids, but getting kids' teeth brushed is a tedious task. At the end of the day, we are tired and cranky and we huddle in the bathroom to brush. Inevitably, my kids complain. But I remind them that their effort prevents them from getting fillings. Having a tooth drilled is not only physically uncomfortable for them, it also is an expensive prospect for me. For the price of some toothbrushes and a couple of minutes a night, we can ensure healthy smiles for years to come. As a city, we have the same choice as my kids and I do. We can spend the upfront time making sure our buildings are being built with low carbon emissions right now, cutting carbon and cutting our costs, or a few years from now, we can retrofit these buildings at a far greater cost than building them sustainably in the first place, basically opting for fillings over toothbrushes. In Boston, 70% of our carbon emissions are already from buildings, and we have over 100 buildings under construction now, with more on the docket. We can't afford to build these buildings with the intention of retrofitting them down the road. We don't have the time. Climate change is already upon us. Each day we choose not to act to reduce our carbon footprint in buildings, we are borrowing against Jonah and Maya's future, the future of all Boston's kids. The time for action is now. Protect our kids' future. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Well said. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you to the Net uh, Zero Carbon panel for hearing this testimony. Let me introduce myself, Dr. Brita Lundberg, infectious diseases physician, member of the Occupational and Environmental Health Committee at the Massachusetts Medical Society, board member of Green Newton, and a member of Mass Health Professionals for Clean Energy. I would like to emphasize three reasons that the city of Boston should consider developing a net zero carbon policy. First, there's a strong public health argument. New construction relies heavily on natural gas for heating and cooking. This is a problem because natural gas creates public health concerns from the point of extraction at the drill rig all the way to the gas leaks in our streets to where it is burned in stoves and furnaces in our homes. Over 900 peer-reviewed medical studies have demonstrated the serious health effects surrounding natural gas infrastructure due most likely to the substances introduced into the gas during extraction. Benzene and formaldehyde cause leukemia and other cancers. Particulate matter causes lung diseases, heart attack, and stroke. 
mercury leads to miscarriage, premature birth, and neurologic disorders. Gas leaks and intentional releases of gas also release ozone, a pollutant that can reduce lung function and worsen bronchitis, emphysema, and asthma. Natural gas also contributes significantly to poor indoor air quality, and burning natural gas in stoves and furnaces exacerbates chronic medical conditions. Childhood asthma, according, uh, according to many peer-reviewed medical studies, is linked to living in a home that uses natural gas to cook with. Gas-burning stoves release many of the same carcinogens that are found near compressor stations and drill rigs. Benzene, styrene, formaldehyde, as well as PM25, which are microscopic particles that cause respiratory disease and cancer in humans. Third, methane is a potent heat-trapping gas that contributes substantially to climate change. When greenhouse gas emissions from any source, gas leaks, power plants, and motor vehicles are reduced or avoided, we experience immediate health benefits right here in Massachusetts because of lower levels of particles in the air that originate from fossil fuel combustion. For these three reasons, buildings need to eliminate gas, and we need to move away from natural gas infrastructure and new construction because we know it harms human health. We at Massachusetts Health Professionals for Clean Energy consider advocating for cleaner air and a response to climate change to be part of our professional responsibility as healthcare providers. As a, as a mechanism to help mitigate the negative health impacts of fossil fuels, this net zero carbon initiative would be a positive step for the Commonwealth and help protect the health of our citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Councillor O'Malley, for holding this hearing, and thank you for all the counselors that are here. My name is Wilhelmina Gumaklido. I am the Clean Energy Program Manager for the Massachusetts Climate Action Network. I am here uh, to represent MCAN, which helps chapters and cities implement climate-friendly policies and projects like net zero planning, and I am representing the Boston Clean Energy Coalition, of which MCAN is a member. The Boston Clean Energy Coalition is a group of organizations focused on helping Boston move from dirty energy to clean energy through grassroots organizing and community engagement. As we all know, right now Boston is going through a building boom with 65 million square feet proposed, planned, or permitted. Much of this building is housing, which we need, but unfortunately due to minimal guidance around climate issues, many of the developers default to running the systems for these buildings with natural gas. This is in direct opposition to the commitments that Mayor, Mayor Walsh and the City Council have made for our community, including our Carbon Free by 2050 commitment that the Mayor signed. Um, the 65 million square feet of buildings being planned and built today will last 50 years or more, way past our 2050 deadline of being carbon neutral. I would like to speak briefly to why the City of Boston needs a net zero planning process. Right now, the city has at least 13 desperate planning processes that do not work with each other. While we applaud the desire to plan for a climate-friendly city, coordination is currently supplementary and not built into the system. Carbon-free Boston is a good idea that has been delayed. In addition, it is my understanding that there is no explicit portion of the process that is about including the public and hearing what the com community wants to see. By the time plans are completed and integrated at this point, which may be as late as 2020, over 450 new buildings would have been built. Those buildings would need to be immediately retrofitted to meet our 2050 goals. This doesn't make any sense. What is needed right now is a bold and more immediate plan that focuses on the built environment, which as we know is responsible for between 50 and 80% of Boston's climate change causing emissions. We need to launch a planning process now that influences how buildings are built today by making them all electric. And we need to do this while the carbon-free Boston study is going on. This is why BCEC and MCAN are in favor of Councilor O'Malley's proposal, and we encourage Boston to move to net zero planning now. Thank you. Thank you very much, appreciate it. Thank you. Rev. 
Good afternoon. My name is Reverend Mariama White Hammond. I'm a minister at the Bethel AME Church in Jamaica Plain and also a member of the Green Justice Coalition, a coalition of predominantly people of color led environmental justice organizations. So I want to start by celebrating that there are many things to be proud of here in Boston. Um, we are um, a leader within the country. Um, and I want to um, be thankful for the work that the Department of Environment, Energy, and Open Space is doing, um, and also very much for the work of Dr. Atiyah Martin, who's been doing a lot of work to help people not just think um, about mitigating climate change, but beginning to be more adaptive and resilient to the f our climate future. So I want to celebrate the work that's being done to encourage people to do the right thing, um, but I, I want to suggest that encouragement may not be quite enough. Um, decades ago, we thought we were doing the best job. We did not know, <laughs> and we came to a point now where we realize that we are really mortgaging the future of our young people. Every bit of energy that we use right now, it's not the allotment that God gave us. We're stealing from our grandchildren um, and future generations and then leaving the bill to them and asking them to take responsibility because we haven't taken responsibility ourselves. A few weeks ago, I had the opportunity, I was on the honorary host committee for Green Build, um, which we recently hosted, brought the sort of best minds in um, green technology from all around the world. And I happened to be at a table with a gentleman from California who sits on the equivalent of our um, EEAC, our Energy, Environ um, Energy Efficiency Advisory Council, which I'm very sad to see that Boston has abdicated its seat on that council to some other municipality. And I wonder if we're trying to be the leaders, why would we step down from a state council that's looking at energy efficiency? But um, I'll ask that to Austin Blackman later. Um, but I, I think, um, you know, I asked him, you know, I knew that recently California has taken the first place away from us, and we uh, have that back and forth often. And he told me that um, the way they've moved forward is that they don't wait on the market, they shape the market. And that councils um, at both the city and state level have the opportunity to tell people this is where we're going. Um, those same buildings will rely on police and fire and water services and all of those things that, that the city helps to provide. Um, and if we want them to be in line, I think we have to send a signal of what it is that we expect from them. And I think we all know that this is really a justice issue, um, that we as a city are really vulnerable, the fourth most vulnerable city in the country. And recently I, um, or earlier this year, was at a meeting of the Green Ribbon Commission um, where we were getting a uh, presentation from UMass Boston. We were sitting on the eighth floor of a building in the inundation district, which is what I, I call it at this point, because I think we need to recognize um, what its future is. Um, and we were getting a PowerPoint presentation in which we watched that district become flooded and were told that that was going to happen um, monthly by as early as 2060. <laughs> this room was full of the top sort of you know, executives, CEOs, leaders of universities, and you could hear a pin drop. You could literally feel the tension rising as we recognized that we were sitting in a building that would flood monthly. That's the kind of future that we're handing over to our children and telling them that you should figure it out down the line. The reality is that right now, Boston is at a crossroads. Everywhere I turn, everything that used to be an empty lot or a small house, is being turned in to fancy condos. It was hard and sad for me. Every Halloween, I hand out candy with my next door neighbors. They always have better costumes, but we hang out on our porches and hand out candy. And they're not there anymore because our next door, and I'm not knocking the people that move there, but our next door um, is now three fancy condos and the residents are not from the city. And um, our neighbors have been pushed out to Quincy. Um, so we're in a moment in this building boom that for many of us who've lived in the cities for years, I've always called the city my home, it's a bittersweet moment. And we watch as this deep pressure of these buildings is causing our housing market to be completely unsustainable for so many of us who have called this place home for decades, for generations at times. And so for those same buildings to put pressure on the planet that might force us to leave this very city because it's not sustainable climate-wise just doesn't make sense. 
if we are going to build all over the city as we currently are, then everything we add to this city should reduce the pressure that we feel and the reality that we face as climate change becomes more and more a reality of life. This is our opportunity, and if we wait 10 or 20 years from now, I don't know about where you live, but there's almost no parcels left in our neighborhood already. And so we've got to move now before we're celebrating the one to two buildings that are green and we're retrofitting the thousands of buildings we've already put up. Um, I know it will be tough, but my mother always used to say when, we, when she gave us a chore we didn't want to do, where there's a will, there's a way. And I trust that in a city that has led the way in innovation, we will find the way, multiple creative solutions of how to get there. But if we wait too long, there may not be enough left to do. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend. It was very inspiring and impactful message. All of you, thank you. Um, and thank you again. This was another phenomenal panel. Uh, I don't have any questions per se other than to say you were incredibly um, impactful with all of your statements and your expertise. And the takeaways I have again is that this is impacting, obviously, our kids, our grandkids, uh, the public health piece, the fact that we do have so many different sort of um, cooks, chefs in the kitchen where we need to streamline, and obviously the urgency is now. Many of you were at, and I've repeated this several times because it was so impactful, at uh, our Community Choice Energy hearing. It just so happened that three uh, consecutive folks who testified in public hearing, one was from Houston, had family in Houston, the other from Puerto Rico, the other from the Caribbean, and had all referenced in passing, we didn't design this, but they were all, their families were impacted by these once in a 500 year storms, three of which occurred in a month's period. So this no longer, when we talk about the impact, it's happening now, it has happened already. So the urgency is, is, is we need to take into account, we need to act now. So thank you all, I don't have any questions, Councilor Flaherty, okay, thank you. Thank you all very much, really, really appreciate it. Wonderful job. Okay, so I have a number of, uh, I think I have four, five, pa six pages of, uh, of public testimony. Most folks have not indicated, have indicated they would not like to testify. So I'm going to call you down, or actually not down, this will be the first time using, or for me, there are two um, singular mics, there's one to the left, one to the right, I believe there's a laptop on that one, but they should be, thank you Michael. Ron, those are both good to go, right? So I'm going to call you, if I don't say your name and you would like to testify, we'll take you at the end, but the first is... Uh, Peter Papish and Elliot Laffer. If Peter and Elliot could take the left and the right. Good afternoon, Peter. Peter Papish. I am uh, a resident. I think you're on now. I think try. There you go. Okay. I heard that. Thank you. Uh, May have to get a little close, but it's definitely on. Thank you for convening this uh, meeting, and I am very much impressed by the two panels that you've heard. Um, I also uh, am. You know, P I'm sorry, Peter. I think can you try that uh, one just instead? It's just it's difficult for some folks to hear. Let's see if that's. Is this any better? There you go. All right. Perfect. Um, Peter Papesh, 50-year uh, resident of Boston, uh, currently the chair of the Boston Society of Architects Sustainability Education Committee. I would recommend, after all these uh, valuable bits of information that we have heard here, that the uh, city council consider the ordinance to be named net zero emissions ordinance because all the buildings that uh, are being built rely on external uh, power being provided. Currently or uh, until the uh, change of the millennium, it was all uh, CO2 producing and, uh, and methane producing uh, um, power sources oil and gas on the one side, and electricity from power stations uh, on the other, where 90% of the power produced by these uh, um, uh, power stations gets lost in, in transmission. 
the uh, future, as you have heard, is in um, uh, electric and all electric buildings, which can be uh, implemented today. They are going to be cheaper. This is a win-win situation. They're going to be cheaper for the developer to build as well as for the buyer of the buildings. It, there is, of course, at this moment, a, a gap in the terms of the uh, cost of uh, electricity versus gas. However, if we build, as you have heard, to, towards the future and look towards the future for all electric buildings, they can be implemented today and at lower cost than the buildings that have to rely on uh, fossil fuels. If the ordinance itself is, uh, draws attention to this, it will actually help everybody in terms of uh, the architects, the developers, the buyers, all being aware that this is the future. It c in part, it is already here and we can implement it. I'm going to go in, uh, and I don't know whether you have this. Uh, I did sure. pass it on Ron, to Ron Cobb, our city messenger, will get it, and I'll make sure. I'll, I will read it, and I'll make sure we get copies <laughs> to all the counselors. Thank so. you. Peter, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Elliot is next, followed by Lee Humphrey. Please, thank you. Councillor, I want to thank you for thank holding you, this Elliot. hearing. Um, I'm Elliot Laffer. I've lived in the back bay now for uh, over 40 years. And in most of that time, I've been involved in uh, review of projects uh, from a civilian point of view. Uh, that's unpaid, I think, is what that word is called. Uh, and you raised earlier the idea that, well, gee, we all have to ask developers to do that as we're in this review process. Many of the, of the, the citizen members have done that. And uh, I guess I think we're still functional, I'm the co-chair of the CAC for the Back Bay South End Gateway Project, and that's developed by Boston Properties, which may be the most enlightened developer in terms of, of energy use and looking for high lead numbers, and yet they push back. And why do they push back? Partially because to go all electric may cost them lead points, mm. just because of the way the lead system is structured. And, and the way Article 37 asked them to, uh, to build. And I think it, to some extent it's a trade of today against tomorrow. And so sometimes to make the most energy efficient or at least the most, yeah, lead efficient building today might give us something that can't meet those standards tomorrow. I think we need to tell people that they have to build their buildings for all electric and that can be specified. It's not a, well, the city can't dictate this. It dictates a whole bunch of things. Um, and that's really the way that, it, that it, the only way it's going to get done. The incentive to then be energy efficient will come because the cost of electricity will eat them up otherwise. When I first bought a condo, I didn't buy a condo with electric heat. This is back in the 1970s, simply because of the cost of, of operating sure. that kind of building. That's changed a whole lot now. Some of the technology has been around for a long time, just gotten better and better. I was selling heat pumps 35, 40 years ago. So mm -hmm. that's not a new idea. It just gets better. Yeah. But I think that we have to make people do it, and our regulation system doesn't always keep up. The idea of Article 37 was great, and the, and the first grab at it is great. Sometimes the zoning code isn't the best place to make these things happen, and once it gets in there, it's hard to get out. But I think we need to push people to not be using gas. Appreciate that, Lee. Thank you very much. Excuse me. Appreciate that, Elliot. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Uh, Lee Humphreys is next, followed by, uh, well, Andy testified on the panel. I don't believe she wants to testify again. Um, you're good. And uh, Ellen Watts. And I just, Lee, it's, you're, you're on perfect timing. You're up to testify. Lee? Yeah, perfect, okay. Uh, all right. <laughs> so, good. Moving right along. Um, Ellen Watts is next, followed by uh, um, Carol Oldman. She had to leave. I apologize for that. And then Cam Wilson. I just ask everyone if you could keep it to um, two minutes, but we're moving right along. So, uh, Ms. Watts? Thank you very Thank much, you. Councillor O'Malley. 
My name is Ellen Watts. I am the president and co-founder of Architera Inc., an architecture and planning firm here in Boston. I lived in Boston for 17 years. I now am a small business owner and work in the innovation district. Um, I was also a co-chair of this report, which I hope may look somewhat familiar to you, although it's nine years old now. It's called Getting to Zero. It was a task force report done with 60 of us working uh, under the direction of uh, Governor Patrick Duvall to set forth some uh, strategies for achieving net zero statewide nine years ago. I would agree with the minister who just sat here that encouragement is great. We can celebrate how far we've come, but we may, may need more than encouragement. I'd like just quickly to say five things that have encouraged me, and I'd like to follow up with a longer letter to you. Yep, of course. Uh, one is a thing that's frequently said to us by our clients, who are CEOs, who are the uh, presidents of colleges and universities, won't LEED take care of this? It is uh, important to understand LEED is a uh, rating system that allows a lot of discretion on the part of the owner and the design team. So you can pick your points. The energy threshold is a mere, used to be 10% better than code and now not even as good as our state building code. So yes, you can make a building 70% energy efficient and ours have for 15 years been between 40 and 70% more energy efficient than required by the building code. And you can get lead points for that, but you don't have to. All you have to do is get the prerequisite. That's why the common misunderstanding, I would say nine out of our 10 clients misunderstand this. Second, the pushback to regulating net zero building, uh, well understood by many of us for almost a decade is, well, the argument that it can't be done for conventional budgets. We have built a portfolio, and many of the architects who are representing uh, in testimony here today have shown that with a conventional budget for a school, for an office building, for a laboratory even, you can build a net zero building, and we would encourage a database of those examples to be uh, known as well as their reduction in operating costs. So same first cost and reduction in operating costs, making it a very wise financial decision. Next is the objection that regulation is not necessary, some say, because you can always go beyond what the code requires. Well, but the code protects us from all kinds of hazards, from tripping to death by fire to asphyxiation by chemical fumes. The general public expects that it will protect us vis-a-vis -vis climate, and it is not satisfactory right now. Furthermore, if you had cancer, would you really like your doctor to say, go take an aspirin? Uh, you can always do more if you want, but mm. for now, let's just take an aspirin. I believe we need a precautionary approach to the environment. Fourth, I'd like to say one of the things that's important to underscore about this study it was uh, a quip. There are no such things as net zero buildings. There are only net zero operators. Training and education is really important uh, for facilities people as well, the as well as the owners of these buildings. Identical building studies have shown can operate in a fourfold different manner. Even if they're designed exactly the same and could be net zero, they can be operated differently. Sort of like somebody who's got a heavy foot on a Prius pedal mm -hmm. will make it very less energy efficient. Um, and lastly, uh, a lot of the regulations, even about pilot programs that the state has been encouraging for net zero uh, have only been applicable to new construction and then only to very large buildings. Uh, I believe the regulations need to pertain to buildings of all sizes. And in fact, one of the important underscores of this study is that the sweet spot for net zero buildings is actually a mid-sized building. Uh, and so anywhere between 10 and 50,000 square feet, interestingly, new construction for large buildings is 50,000 feet and above. So we're missing the sweet spot in some of the tests we've already done. Thank you very much for considering testimony. No, for thank you very much. Appreciate that. Great overview. Thank you. Uh, Cam Wilson, followed by Karen Weber. I don't know if Karen's still here. And then Jack Gregg. And again, if you could just keep it to a couple minutes, we are moving right along. Um, hello, Cam. Hi. How are you? Fine. How are you? Uh, I, I just wanted to put in my word for the third world, people who are already, already drowning, and the humanity, which we have to save the human race, and we have to do everything we can, even if it costs a little bit more. You all know that. Thank you. Well said, Cam. Thank you. Is Karen Weber here or Jack Gregg? Jack, please. Yep. And then after Jack, we've got uh, Michael McCord. 
And that's all I have for uh, public uh, testimony that is signed. Um, we may be missing a sheet. I didn't see your name, John. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll get. Yep. We'll get. Please, um, Jack, and then Michael McCord. Hello, I'm Jack Rigg. I'm a resident of Back Bay uh, since 1998. I came to speak okay. about uh, the citizens who live in the city uh, and the electric infrastructure needed to support those that wish to do that and we want to encourage. We never plan to fail, but we often fail to plan. One of the unsexy parts about electric vehicles happens to be o governance and oversight. We are looking at a situation that we hope in the future we'll see tens of thousands of electric vehicles owned by residents living in the city. There are many, many garage orphans of those cars because they park in the street and we will have to provide a system or a network of charging systems both conductive and inductive to those vehicles that are owned by residents who live in the city. Too many of the plans currently favor only those that commute into the city or visit the city. And the public good uh, is not represented for residents who live in the city. In fact, they are handicapped. Uh, they need uh, the public trust for the public good established in the rules, regulations, and coordination between all those entities that will be responsible providing that service as well as that infrastructure to the citizens that live in the city so that we may garnish the benefits from the reduction of emissions, uh, reduction of noise, uh, improvement in property values as well as uh, the uh, overall effects it will have against uh, climate change. Uh, I would invite the council and any of those organizations statewide to give due consideration to the coordination between not only the city departments but the state departments such as the DMV which would be key to gathering information on the distribution and the placement and location of electric vehicle users and to be able to track the 10 percent or so of electric vehicles which will be conversions from gas powered vehicles as a uh, experimental uh, vehicle uh, that is still uh, subject to safety inspection at least on an annual basis. Uh, again, uh, if we fail to provide the rules and the guidance and we let this just develop wildly, uh, it is all too often that we don't bother to have the rules put in place for enforcement or for uh, transparency or accountability or uh, metrics for dashboards for effective presentation and uh, delivery of services to the public until after something has grossly gone wrong. Let's not let somebody get hurt or killed before we decide to plan and put the rules in place for welcoming this large network of support to our residents of the city. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Michael McCord, and that is all I have, but John, I know you wanted to speak, so you can come up next, and then anyone else that wants to follow James, Michelle. Uh, Mr. McCord, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor, for holding this hearing. It's been very, very enlightening. Um, I believe that we cannot get to carbon zero if we don't break free of our dependency on carbon fuels. Across this country, people are rising up opposing the further development of infrastructure in support of carbon fuels. Gas pipelines and oil pipelines across the country are being stood up against because there's no future if we continue that dependency. The burning of fossil fuels has caused global warming. We know that and it will continue to do so at dangerously accelerating rates unless we say no to carbon fuels. And before the City Council is an opportunity, I believe, to do so. Many of us believe that it's a moral imperative that we encourage the City of Boston to not allow any more new buildings to go up that are going to burn carbon fuels. We know that our planet is in peril from the burning of these fuels. And we must collectively do everything we possibly can to reduce their admission, to reduce their expansion. LEED certification, and isn't it interesting that LEED says nothing at all about the 
about the source of the fuels that are delivered to those buildings. LEED certification, green walls and twirly things like they put up on the top of 88 Boylston Street, 888 Boylston Street, are weak tea and delude us into thinking that we are really attacking the problem of global warming when we're not. What is possible? I think it's possible that we demand that all new buildings in the city of Boston right now be fueled by renewable sources for heating and cooling and cooking and lighting instead of by fossil fuels. Of course, the developers will complain. Perhaps we should let them. Let them absorb some of the costs as a condition for building in this wonderful city that's committed to reducing greenhouse gases. Let them absorb some of those costs as a price for doing business in this city and for helping the clean energy sector develop. And finally, let them absorb some of those costs as an emblem that they too care about the planet and not just about short-term profits. The developers, supported by the fossil fuel industry, will make the argument that clean energy is prohibitively expensive. They offer, however, no analysis of that assertion. Moreover, their assertion ignores several important considerations having to do with costs. First, as the clean energy sector responds to new demand, as it develops new technologies, which we heard about today, and as it, and, and as it begins to compete, new energy sources will be developed and prices can reasonably be expected to decline. Second, the multimillionaires to whom the developers are marketing their luxury housing can likely afford to pay a bit more for clean energy until the price stabilizes and comes down. Third, the assertion about clean ed energy costs being too high steps completely around the incomprehensibly high costs of dirty energy to life and property. See Sandy, Harvey, Irma, and Maria. Those hurricanes are generally recognized as having been made more destructive by global warming, which in turn is worsened by greenhouse gases. I encourage the City Council to help the developers and the people in the fossil fuel industry toward their better selves by requiring them to be part of the transformation of the world from fossil fuels to clean energy. Somewhere in government, a group of public officials needs to stand up to these enormous economic and political forces and say, no more greenhouse gases, no more profits before the planet, and no more self-delusion about this existential crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Well said. Thank you. There's also a written testimony. Oh, we already have that. Thank you. Um, James O. Michel, who's my last uh, public testimony. I don't know if that one works. You may want to try the other one. Is there anyone else who would like to yeah, speak? Got to, got to get, um, make a quick statement as well. Uh, right. Thank you. Thank Tom, you, well. James. Good, great, great hearing, important stuff. Um, I just wanted to add one little, piece, one, one little thread um, that was touched on. Uh, Joan Fitzgerald mentioned Tim McDonald, who was one expert. We John Delzell. Just to, that was John Delzell. Uh, oh, no, I'm it was, sorry. It was actually it was Joan. Oh, I, say, I thought you said John. I apologize. Please. Um, no, Tim McDonald, who a passive house builder who's in multiple states now. But um, I think we uh, all need to sort of conceptually break um, sort of the big commercial buildings down from, as Mariama said, the, 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 all the residential units that are, that are filling every single vacant lot and, and redeveloping old parking lots and stuff like that. And um, what Tim McDonald is doing in the state of Pennsylvania and what the state of Pennsylvania is doing is it is awarding um, bonus points in competitive bids for low-income housing development to anybody that commits to build to passive house standards. Uh, why can't we do that? We should be doing that. So, um, you know, that's my sort of one additional point uh, to add. There, so. Thank you. Thank you, John. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, gentlemen, 
you just want to uh, say your name and if you have affiliation or your uh, neighborhood. Name is Kanan Thiruvengadam. I live in East Boston. And um, I've been to a couple of BCEC meetings and I, I believe I've seen you as well. Thank you, I've never seen you. Once, <laughs> once or twice. Uh, so um, the executive branch likes this phrase and I like that phrase also, development without displacement. It sounds good, right? And that is what we want. In the same way, we should also be saying it should be development without destruction of our children's future. Right? And, and so hopefully this is a phrase that we can adopt and keep, keep repeating because it's very easy to forget the cost of our life today. I, I run a little urban farm in East Boston and the first thing we had to do when we got in there was to test the soil and the soil was full of lead, which means we couldn't grow in the soil, we had to buy soil. So the cost that we incurred in, our, in terms of buying new soil from wherever and bringing it over and the transport carbon cost, all of that is because somebody used lead in their paint, right? And they didn't pay for that, of course. So this way, we're just kind of passing on the cost to the future, and this one would be unbearable for the next coming generation. So we should be completely conscious of that. And um, in terms of doing development, it, you can't avoid doing development. There's a lot of demand for development, but it should be done without the destruction of the future, which means we need to do sustainable development and Carbon Free Boston is a great initiative and Net Zero will be a critical part of that. I have studied a little bit of the climate change checklist because I live in East Boston, I'm watching the waterfront development going on and a lot of these buildings have been permitted already and they do according to whatever the permit allowed at the time of the permit. So they don't, they're not required to do what they should do given what we know today in terms of sea level rise and coastal flooding and stormwater and all that kind of threats that we face, but they don't. However, there is a checklist that uh, BPD has developed, which, has, which makes you think, it actually does make you think. When you go through the checklist, it makes you think how prepared you are to face the, all the threats that you're going to face as a waterfront development in terms of both stormwater and sea level rise and urban heat island effect and all that. But it does not make you commit to any action that you are taking in terms of those threats. It asks you to make a list of things that you're doing, and so you may list a few things, and then that's where that ends. Whether you actually do it, you know, nobody's gonna hold you accountable for that. So in that sense, the checklist is toothless. And for us to actually have some teeth, it needs to be made, made part of the requirements, and that's, wh that's where the point about cancer, and it wouldn't be, nice of the doctor to say, take an aspirin, and you can always do more. You know, that, that doesn't work, so, mm -hmm. so we need to bring it into the code to say this is what is required for us to have a sustainable development. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much, appreciate it, thank you. <laughs> Sir. Hi, my name is Dan Bailey. I'm also a resident of East Boston. Um, I want to thank you for holding the hearing. Um, I was thrilled to see the Carbon Free Boston uh, initiative announced. I think this is going to be a crucial step. Uh, the time for action is now. Um, it's easy to make commitments about our carbon future. It's, it's uh, tough to take action. Um, and I think this will be an important step in that direction. Um, but that said, um, I think it's also important that when we talk about zoning regulations um, and building regulations that we look at buildings uh, from a life cycle analysis perspective. Um, and when we do that, we take into account not just the costs of a, operating costs of a building, but the environmental costs of constructing a building and perhaps eventually demolishing a building. Um, and when you do that kind of analysis, um, you tend to find that um, even a new green building can take between 10 and 80 years just to make up for the um, uh, carbon emissions associated with constructing the building. Um, and I found in, in my own neighborhood, and I think it's true across the city, um, that with the current wave of building, um, we tend to be demolishing and replacing buildings at kind of an alarming rate. Um, and I think on, in many cases unnecessarily so. Um, so I, I'd like to urge the council um, to consider uh, buildings uh, from a life cycle analysis perspective and um, to recognize um, that there is a, one of the ways to limit carbon emissions is to encourage um, the reuse of buildings. Um, so we tend to focus a lot on, on reducing residential waste and recycling cans and bottles. 
um, I think it's time that we also start thinking about recycling buildings, which tend to be one of our most valuable assets um, with one of the largest uh, environmental you know, uh, impacts you can have um, in thinking about new, new development. Thanks. Great. Well said. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else wanting to speak before we wrap it up? All right. Well, a couple of things I just want to clo close on. First, thank you all for coming. And, and I know um, I want to thank my colleagues as well. It's, it, we, we had some trepidation holding the hearing now because it's the last, tomorrow's, or Wednesday's the last council meeting. There was a big council luncheon earlier. There's a lot going on. But the fact that we had seven councillors and two councillors elect show up, uh, and thank you for the advocates for making that happen. That shows how important this issue is to all of us. Um, I am going to conclude the hearing presently, and then in the new year we will start. I'm not sure what the procedure will be. It may be a hearing and order again. It may be more of a less formalized working session, which I actually I prefer for talking about issues like this. But rest assured, you have my commitment, obviously, working with the BCEC and so many great advocates. We're going to continue this. Um, we are closer to 2050 than we are than we were to 1983, and most of us remember 1983, and it doesn't seem that long ago. So we have a lot of work to do. I think, as I said, there were two sort of most important takeaways from this, or three takeaways. One, we know what has been done to great success in other cities, and that's uh, so some of those things we should be emulating, particularly in California, particularly in Vancouver, particularly in Denver and some other cities. Uh, secondly, we have a lot of good people, well-intentioned people doing good work at the city level, but we want to make sure there's a better streamlined process and a better oversight and really a master print going forward or sort of a master plan going forward. And then thirdly, we do not have the luxury of time, full stop. We have to act now. We have to really, um, the conversation should be over as far as I'm concerned. We need to invest in renewable renewable energy infrastructure, not the same old fossilized fuels, because we will never get out of this mess. So we have a heck of a lot of work to do, but I know I've got the best team to get it done. So for now, in 2017, this hearing is adjourned. Look forward to getting back to work in 2018. <laughs> happy holidays. Happy New Year's, everybody.